In order to have an effective constitution, there needs to be a process for determining whether or not its requirements have been met or if its limitations have been exceeded. This inevitably leads to the controversy of the ultimate arbiter. Is there one ultimate arbiter of the Constitution whose word is the final say? And if so, who is it? Let's start by asking the question, who can decide if an act is unconstitutional? We'll look at the three branches, starting with the legislative branch. Certainly, if a new act is under debate, the legislators can determine for themselves if it violates the Constitution. If so, they can vote against it. They can also review laws already on the books if they wish, and if they find them to be unconstitutional, they can repeal them. No one disputes the power of Congress to do this, although they hardly do it at all anymore. The judicial branch is generally where the decisions of constitutionality are made, and particularly in the Supreme Court. Article 3 gives the Supreme Court and its lower courts jurisdiction in all cases arising under the Constitution so they can absolutely knock down any law in any case before them as being unconstitutional. It doesn't get removed from the books, but prosecutors know that trying to prosecute them is a lost cause. The first case where this was determined was in Marbury v. Madison in 1803. It happened after the lame duck Adams administration tried to stymie the incoming administration by appointing 16 circuit judges and 42 justices of the peace loyal to him and not Jefferson. Not all of the appointments were delivered by the time Adams left office, and Jefferson ordered his executives not to deliver them. William Marbury, one of the appointees who was stopped from taking office, sued Secretary of State James Madison and lost because the case law he was depending on was found to be unconstitutional. The court ruled, if both the law and the Constitution apply to a particular case, the Constitution is superior to any ordinary act of the legislature. The Constitution, and not such ordinary act, must govern the case to which they both apply. This means that the courts have not only the power, but also the obligation to strike down any law in abeyance of the Constitution. But what of the executive branch? Does the President have the authority to decide for himself if a particular law violates the Constitution? If so, is he obligated to refuse to execute the law? Or is he obligated to follow all laws passed by Congress without the ability to decide on their constitutionality absent a federal court decision. Let's look at the words of Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story in his commentaries on the Constitution. Whenever any question arises as to the exercise of any power by any of these functionaries, such functionaries must, in the first instance, decide upon the constitutionality of the exercise of such power. The officers of each of these departments are equally bound by their oaths of office to support the Constitution of the United States and are therefore conscientiously bound to abstain from all acts which are inconsistent with it. If, for instance, the President is required to do any act, he is not only authorized, but required, to decide for himself whether, consistently with his constitutional duties, he can do the act. So the President, like the Supreme Court, not only has the power to refuse to execute bad laws, he also has the obligation to refuse to do so. Okay, so any functionary, the president or whoever, has to make the decision at the time as to whether or not his act contravenes the Constitution. But this hasn't really helped us determine who the ultimate arbiter is. Who has the final word? To try and find the answer, let's go through the process government must go through in order to convict someone. In the first place, a law must be passed. No one can be prosecuted for breaking a law that doesn't exist. As we saw in Lecture 3, Congress absolutely has the ability not to pass any law or repeal any existing law they determine to be unconstitutional. But let's say they don't. Let's also say that this particular law has been upheld by the Supreme Court. There was a case some years ago, and the court found it constitutional. Now a citizen is arrested for violating this law. In order for this to happen, the arresting officer, who swears a constitutional oath just like everyone else in government, must be satisfied that the law does not violate the Constitution. Likewise, the prosecutor, having sworn the same oath, must feel that the law is not contrary to the Constitution. But what if the prosecutor brings the person into court anyway? Then it goes to a trial by jury. The defense might be able to get the case thrown out on constitutional grounds before it goes to trial. That's the right of the writ of habeas corpus, the foundation for all our other rights, but if that doesn't happen, all of the evidence is presented to the jury, and it is in their hands. Despite the fact that prosecutors claim to represent the people, it is really the juries who do. 
The prosecution represents the government. In order to put someone in jail, you have to run it by a jury of the defendant's peers, the representatives of the people, before you can lock him up. Can the jury make the decision as to whether or not the law the defendant is accused of breaking violates the Constitution? Or is the jury helpless in this regard, stuck with whatever the judge instructs them? The idea that the jury can decide that the law is wrong and vote to acquit a defendant anyway is called jury nullification, and it has an old and honorable history going back before the founding of our country. Probably the earliest trial that established jury nullification was when William Penn was arrested for preaching the Quaker religion in 1670. His trial was presided over by the Lord Mayor of the City of London, who pressured the jury to convict. When they acquitted Penn, the Lord Mayor threw them in jail for contempt. They went without food, water, or access to toilet facilities for four days, but never relented. Finally, the Lord Mayor had no choice but to let Penn and the jurors go. This set two important precedents. One, that an acquittal from a jury cannot be overturned, and two, a jury cannot be punished for delivering a verdict the judge doesn't like. Their word is the last word in that particular case. Of course, a jury verdict only applies to that one case, but a pattern of jury nullification can have lasting effects. In 1734, newspaper editor John Peter Zenger was arrested for seditious libel after printing an article critical of the governor of New York. At this point, truth was not considered to be a defense to libel. His lawyer, Alexander Hamilton, convinced the jury that the law was wrong and Zinger should not be faced with libel simply because he printed the truth. The jury agreed. This set the ball rolling for a number of other instances of nullification of libel and slander, and as a result, to this day, truth as a defense to slander and libel is absolutely supported in every court in America. Later on, American colonists such as John Hancock were bypassing customs to avoid the Stamp Act. Jurors refused to convict them, however, and this prompted the king to declare such matters under admiralty law, bypassing the jury requirement. This is the reason for the trial by jury complaint in the Declaration of Independence, and Hancock's lawyer, John Adams, spoke most emphatically of the jurors' ability to determine the legitimacy of the law. At the time the Constitution was ratified, nullification was universally considered to be a part of trial by jury. Remember from Lecture 2 that only an amendment can change the meaning of the Constitution. The opinion of judges on nullification today doesn't matter. Juries still have this ability. It continued well into this country's history. Throughout the 1800s, jurors refused to convict runaway slaves and return them to their masters, and they refused to convict those who helped them escape. The fugitive slave laws, allowed by the Constitution at that time, had to keep being revised and strengthened as they faced greater and greater opposition from juries. Slavery was ultimately repealed by the 13th Amendment in 1865, but if it hadn't been, it seems clear the jury opposition to slavery would only have grown stronger. Jury nullification continued in the labor trials of the late 1800s. Workers who were mistreated by the big corporations that had sprung up began to form unions and to strike. They were prosecuted under the law, but juries refused to convict them. This is where the first salvo against jury nullification was fired. In 1895, the Supreme Court, pressured by the large corporations, ruled that courts no longer had to inform juries that they could veto an unjust law. They didn't have the power to remove the right of jury nullification, but they did put a stop to the courts informing juries that they have this right. They also began deliberately lying to the juries, saying that they may only consider the facts of the case and not the law, in abeyance of centuries of precedent. They also stopped defense lawyers who tried to inform juries of this right. Nonetheless, jury nullification continued. During Prohibition, juries kept refusing to convict people accused of selling or consuming alcohol. This was a major contributing factor in the repeal of Prohibition. And it hasn't stopped there. It was used during the Vietnam War to stop the persecution of protesters, and it is used today in states where medical marijuana is legal to prevent federal conviction of medical marijuana patients. But it doesn't happen as often as it should, as not only are juries misinformed, they're also being instructed to inform the judge whenever a juror is arguing for nullification. But it still happens. Because for everything they've done, they still cannot change the fact that an acquittal cannot be overturned and a jury cannot be punished for its verdict. That is the essence of jury nullification. What this means is, the ultimate arbiter is the people. The voice of the people through juries has been used many times before and during our country's history to stop bad laws and stop the abuse of legitimate laws. 
Not only that, but the power of the people to change the Constitution through the process of amendment gives them one more weapon. An amendment can clarify the people's position on how the Constitution reads or change the meaning of the Constitution altogether. Once again, you now have information that most American citizens lack, and even constitutional law attorneys and professors. They've spent so long telling us that we're helpless and have no recourse but to follow the law no matter what it is that we've come to believe it. And as long as we believe it, it's true. But the day we reject it, the day we realize that all legitimate power comes from the people, is the day that we can begin to take our country back again. Every tyrant lives in fear of the day the people realize that they are stronger than he is, and that he only rules as long as they allow him to. We have more power as people in this country than any country before us. It's time we started wielding it for ourselves again. Until next time, stay strong and be free.